Charlie. Thank you. Sergeant Jones, if you could start your cloud recording, please. Cloud started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of General Welfare. At this time, would all panelists, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification purposes. Once again, please turn on your videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices on silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Levin, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committee will be conducting an oversight hearing to examine the impact of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic on SNAP administration, food pantries, and soup kitchens. Despite progress on food insecurity in the years prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, too many New Yorkers faced hungry, hunger, missed meals, and insufficient access to adequate and healthy food. The widespread loss of income and unemployment due to the pandemic has significantly exacerbated food insecurity in New York City and around the United States. The Department of Social, Service, Social Services testified in the executive budget hearings earlier this year that there were three times as many SNAP applications than prior to the pandemic. In order to accommodate the increase in applications during a public health crisis, the agency retrained 1,500 staff members to manage enrollment and recertifications remotely. Despite the agency's swift efforts to mobilize their staff and to reorient benefit applications to the Access HRA application and telephone interviews, clients have reported long wait times dropped calls on the phone and difficulty navigating their cases remotely. According to the Food Bank of New York's report from June, 75% of food pantries and soup kitchens surveyed reported serving more New Yorkers in April 2020 than in the months prior to the pandemic. And of the pantries and kitchens reporting an increase in visitors, 91% reported an increase in first time visitors, 79% reported an increase in families with children, 71% reported an increase in laid off or furloughed workers, and 59% reported an increase in undocumented immigrants. In April, during the peak of the virus in New York City, the number of recipients for SNAP increased by 68,714, which according to Hunger Free New York is the largest one month increase in modern times. The federal government's efforts to impose additional barriers to SNAP enrollment prior to the pandemic, coupled with threats to funding, will only exacerbate this crisis. I hope today's hearing will offer insight into the essential work of the emergency food providers throughout this crisis and how the council can further support these efforts to ensure that we're doing everything we can to get every New Yorker the food that they need. I want to thank the advocates and the members of the public who are joining us today. Um, I want to thank representatives from the administration for joining us, and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. Um, at the moment, I would like to now acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. And let's see. I'd like to acknowledge Council Members Holden and Gradechik. Um, we do expect uh, new. Uh, council members to be joining us as well. And 
I would also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, committee staff, Amanda Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie O'Marie, policy analyst, and Frank Sarno, finance analyst. With that, I'll turn it over to the counsel of the committee, Amanda Kilowan. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good morning, everyone. I am Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify. At that point, you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling panelists to testify today. Please listen for their name to be called, and I will periodically be announcing which panelists will be called next. The first three panelists will be members of the administration. HRA Chief Special Services Officer Annette Holm, followed by HRA Chief Program Officer Lisa Fitzpatrick, with Kate McKenzie, Director of Food Policy, present for questions. And I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and Chair Levin will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, and that includes both your questions and the answers to those questions. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we'll not be allowing a second round of questioning. Now I'm going to call upon our members of the administration to testify. And they are Annette Holm, Lisa Fitzpatrick, and Kate McKenzie. At this point, I will deliver the oath to the administration. So if you'll all please listen to the oath and at the end of it, you may um, affirm. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you, and you may begin when you are ready. Sorry, Lisa, I think you're, you're still muted. I there got you. There okay. you go. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson Levin and members of the City Council's General Welfare Committee for the opportunity to testify about the agency's efforts to address the urgency of hunger and food insecurity in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Lisa Fitzpatrick. I am the Chief Program Officer for the City of New York Human Resources Administration. Testifying with me today is Annette Holm, Chief Special Services Officer for the New York City Human Resources Administration, and Kate McKenzie, Director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. My testimony today will be focused, will be focused on HRA's administration of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, and the Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, during this crisis period. As we have testified in the past and as advocates and the council are aware, food insecurity is one result of unemployment, underemployment, declining wages, and the increasing cost of food, rent, and other commodities. COVID-19 has exacerbated all of these factors and for many low-income New Yorkers, jeopardized their economic stability and overall well-being. Every day, and particularly during these unprecedented times, HRA provides critical programs and supports to low-income New Yorkers. Today, I will focus on SNAP and EFAP, which are, are aimed squarely at reducing hunger and tackling food insecurity. COVID-19 challenged our agency like never before, resulting in moving to work swiftly and in lockstep with our partners in government and the not-for-profit community to alleviate the burden for so many New Yorkers having to worry about where their next meal is coming from. In March, recognizing the gravity and scale of the mobilization effort required to galvanize and marshal resources to address New York City's food needs during the pandemic, Catherine Garcia, former Department of Sanitation Commissioner, was appointed as the COVID-19 food czar. Through a co coordinated agency effort, 
the Food Czars team spearheaded a citywide initiative that provided more than 135 million meals to hungry and food insecure New Yorkers. Further, under the Food Czar, the city took action to secure the city's food supply chain and support regional agriculture, intervene to keep food pantries and other vital emergency feeding charities open and equip them to meet the surge in demand for their services. Through these actions, New York City responded, organized, and expanded food avail avail availability to our most vulnerable residents. Today, the city is delivering approximately 400,000 meals each day through its emergency food delivery program, which provides meals to low-income homebound New Yorkers, including seniors, in addition to serving another 450,000 grab-and-go meals at over 400 New York City schools. The sheer volume of applications received by the agency during the emergency is indicative of the heightened need for food security resources at this time. During the height of the pandemic, the agency received 84,000 SNAP applications in April 2020, the highest number of SNAP applications in modern history and more than a 200% increase compared to the 27,000 applications received in April 2019. The vast majority of SNAP applications have been submitted electronically outside of centers through Access HRA, which has revolutionized the client experience in accessing services. Almost 99% of applications were received electronically by the agency using Access HRA in May 2020, compared to 90% in February of 2020. The increased usage of the online portal and mobile app, coupled with the agency's longstanding efforts to provide clients with flexible case service options, has significantly reduced in-center traffic, undoubtedly saving lives by limiting client and staff exposure to the virus in compliance with social distancing directives. Since mid-March, SNAP center traffic dropped significantly with a, with a daily average of approximately 250 visitors in April 2020, compared to 2,600 visitors in April 2019. In order to meet the demand, with the number of SNAP applications tripled in this period, and, and cash assistance applications doubled, HRA redeployed and retrained staff across the agency, as well as recruited staff temporarily from other city agencies, such as ACS and DCAS, as well as Metro Plus to help to process the high number, high volume of applications. In meeting this challenge and to protect staff and clients, HRA built a new remote access platform deploying technology to enable staff to index documents, process applications, and interview clients remotely. In total, we reassigned 1,285 employees from various areas within DSS and HRA and recruited an additional 198 from other agencies. Through HRA's advocacy, we received approval for a range of critical waivers from the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, OTDA, working with the United States Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Service, Food and Nutrition Service, FNS, to help expedite the processing of applications. This effort enabled us to continue to, to continue the work required to provide client access to food benefits while prioritizing the health and safety of staff and clients. Working under unprecedented circumstances, the agency was responsive to the rapidly changing information and public health guidance to ensure continued access to benefits for clients. For example, in the early phase of COVID, when HRA's offices remained open, we communicated to clients that no negative case actions would be taken if they did not attend 
scheduled in-person appointments due to concerns with COVID-19. Subsequently, on March 24th, we received public health guidance that led to the agency's decision to consolidate HRA, lo HRA locations such as job, SNAP, and Medicaid locations, move our back office operations to a remote environment, seek the aforementioned waivers, and to offer an array of digital or telephonic services. Our partnership with the state through relationships built over the years enabled the agency to request and receive permission to accept cash assistance applications online and to conduct interviews over the telephone, which began on March 20th. We had been advocating for the ability to conduct by telephone the, the interview portion of the cash assistance application process for a number of years. Given the efficiency and channel shift of applying and recertifying for SNAP. With federal and state approval, SNAP clients can apply, recertify, and submit documents using Access HRA. This was a reform that DSS successfully advocated for in 2015. During the pandemic, with the Access HRA platform in place and operational, the agency was able to act swiftly in March 2020 to temporarily close all locations, excuse me, to temporarily close most locations, but ensured services were still available in each borough in order to protect the health and safety of, of staff and clients while still meeting the needs of but while still meeting the need for individuals who prefer to access services in, perfect, in person. Prior to COVID, as a result of the agency's proactive advocacy in December 2019, 96% of SNAP application interviews and 87% of recertification interviews were held via telephone. And the percentage of SNAP applications submitted online had increased to 89%. Months later, during the pandemic, families and individuals sought assistance through sought assistance through us from home, allowing us to prioritize public health during that time. 99% of all SNAP business is conducted remotely and outside of centers. The goal of securing the same client access without the need to come into an office for cash assistance as we achieve for SNAP has and continues to be a priority of the agency. In fact, we built a system for online cash assistance applications before we had state approve it to use it outside of our centers and in other than a limited pilot with 13 community partners enabling us to go live once the pandemic waiver was obtained in just a matter of days. As has been noted, we pushed for these changes in the days before the crisis hit. As a result, we quickly received OTDA approval to permit New York City residents to submit joint applications for cash assistance and SNAP online. Within four days of OTDA approval, the agency stood up the system to apply for cash assistance SNAP online and provided telephone interviews as needed. As a result, as of April, as a result of this critical reform, 85% of cash assistance applications are now submitted online. We also secured federal and OTDA approval through the end of December 2020 to waive the requirement for a client's physical or electronic signature on SNAP and cash assistance applications so that an HRA employee may, cap, may complete the application over the telephone with the client. This waiver allowed us to implement a process by which a cash assistance or SNAP application is completed over the phone for any applicant who lacks internet connectivity internet ready devices, the ability to complete a mail or fax applications are homebound 
or have challenges using Access HRA for application submission. Clients who call HRA InfoLine and indicate they are unable to apply online are provided with alternatives, including the option to apply by telephone. Our waiver request to permit community-based organizations to provide this telephone application was denied. However, it is worth noting that pre-COVID-19, Benefits Data Trust, because of their ability to record a telephonic signature, was able to submit SNAP-only applications and recertifications for individuals unable to use Access HRA. As mentioned, Securing critical waivers is at the core of the agency's COVID-19 response. Currently, our work involves requesting extensions of important benefits-related waivers that were previously approved. Thankfully for New Yorkers who rely on our services, many of our extension requests were recently granted for waivers under which we have been operating. The waivers and extensions enable DSS to meet the increased demand for benefits in a safe way to avoid, where possible, clients having to come in person to centers. The below waivers have been extended through December 31st, 2020. That's the SNAP and cash assistance signature waiver for telephone applications taken by HRA staff, cash assistance telephone interview waiver, drug alcohol and domestic violence screenings by telephone, extension of domestic violence waivers, partial extension of the SNAP interview adjustments for recertifications only, but not applications. The interview adjustments for initial SNAP applications expired on August 31st, 2020. All SNAP applicants must have an interview before any benefits may be issued in accordance with the partial SNAP interview adjustments from the federal government. We have asked OTDA to seek an extension of the interview adjustments for applications and are hopeful that it will be granted. But for now, the, inter the application interview requirement is in effect. The federal government extended the SNAP recertification waiver through August 31st, 2020. We encourage clients with SNAP cases that were due to recertify by August 31st, 2020 to recertify. At the federal government's direction, we opened the recertification portal and processed a significant number of the August cases. There was no adverse action taken for not recertifying at that time. As required by the federal government, USDA, recertification for SNAP benefits resumed for those cases due to expire on September 30th, 2020. Clients must now recertify to continue receiving SNAP benefits. Recertifications can be completed through Access HRA and documentation submission can be conducted through mobile document upload feature of the Access HRA mobile app. It remains the case that there is no need for clients to visit an HRA SNAP office. Clients who are due to recertify by September 30th, 2020 have had the ability to recertify now since the period was opened on August 1st, 2021. We do not yet have a waiver on recertifications for this month. So as required by the federal government, clients must recertify in order to continue receiving benefits. For SNAP cases due to recertify, because of the SNAP interview adjustments from the federal government, which expired December 31st, 2020, only some SNAP cases will require an interview. Those clients who do require an interview will receive a telephone call from HRA staff. As a reminder, based on the federal waiver, we can recertify the SNAP case without an interview, provided that both of the following conditions have been met. The applicant's identity has been verified and all other mandated information and verification has been provided and is valid. 
Social security number is already, is already required by federal law. Residency, gross non-exempt income, both earned and unearned. Disability, alien eligibility is already required by federal law. Pursuant to the federal waiver, if either of these conditions has not been met, then an interview will be required. Under the federal waiver, interviews will still be required if any of the information submitted is unclear or cannot be verified through separate data matches. The state also extended our recertification waiver for cash assistance until August 31st, 2020. We encourage clients with cash assistance cases that were due to recertify by August 31st, 2020 to do so for the same reasons as above. There were no adverse actions for not doing so at that time. Cash assistance clients who are due to recertify by September 30th, 2020 have had the ability to recertify since the period opened on August 1st, 2020. Clients must recertify in order to continue receiving benefits. Recertifications can be completed through Access HRA. There is no need for these clients to, to visit an HRA office. We continue our advocacy as waiver periods approach the dates on which they expire. It is imperative that these administrative changes become permanent. We know that these changes provide for a dignity-centered model and, as we have seen over the last six months, protect public health and safety. HRA also sought to implement various SNAP program changes to ensure all households continue receiving the proper SNAP allotment. Emergency allotments of SNAP initially were approved for March and April 2020 but at HRA's urging, New York State secured approval to extend emergency allotment supplements through September 2020. SNAP participating households received the maximum SNAP benefit allowance. In addition to all the COVID-19 SNAP pandemic program operational changes, DSS HRA also worked to waive the ABOT requirements on, until September 2020, with a statewide waiver also granted until September 2021, and ensure that once the, the federal pandemic unemployment insurance benefits lapse, this income was removed from households' budgets, ensuring the maximum benefit level. HRA's Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, provides funding to 578 community kitchens and food pantries citywide. EFAP provides over 40 food items and purchases the most nutritious food items that also meet the dietary and cooking needs of special populations, such as homeless New Yorkers, those with HIV AIDS, and those who require a kosher or halal diet. The actual purchase of these items is based on an analysis of the needs and trends of the emergency food network. HRA also requires that all 578 emergency food programs funded by EFAP provide SNAP outreach services. These services include SNAP eligibility pre-screening, assistance with the SNAP application process, and the distribution of SNAP materials that promote this nutritional benefit. The FY21 EFAP budget is 20.9 million and includes 0.7 million in funds that were added at adoption. Funding for HRA's EFAP program, including food and administrative expenses, was fully baselined by the administration and the funding continues to be leveraged to provide non-perishable and frozen food, as well as to provide administrative grants to non-food related expenses to support the EFAP network and the cost of warehousing and transportation. In 2020, EFAP distributed more than 14,972,000 
681 pounds of food, including over 1,029,780 pounds of frozen food. In the same period, EFAP programs reported serving more than 17,620,975 people. While working to ensure that New Yorkers have a hot, healthy meal, we are also working to reduce the prevalence of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Since 2008, EFAP has required all food purchased with city funding to be compliant with the New York City food standards requirements and meet nutritional standards, including but not limited to standards for sodium, sugar, and trans fat. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, EFAT continues to explore the purchase of nutrition with nutritional foods for all populations, including those with special dietary needs and those without cooking facilities. Increases in funding have enabled individual programs to receive increased allocations. EFAP continues to build off the work of the New York City Food Assistance Collaborative to identify additional neighborhoods that have a high supply gap and need increased capacity and additional food to address it. During this crisis, New York City's food pantries have been vital partners, particularly at this difficult time. Supporting them was a priority as part of our urgent response to keeping New Yorkers fed. We shared pandemic-related safety guidance with all of our EFAP food pantry providers, encouraging them to continue operations to provide critical services to food insecure New Yorkers in a way that is safe for everyone. Food distribution to those in need remains our most important objective. DSS Emergency Intervention Services developed and shared informational guidance on best practices for EFAP food providers, including the need for expanded pickup hours to decrease the number of clients that visit at a given time, discouraging lines and mass groups congregating by offering where appropriate diverse pre-bagged items, for example, family size, demographic, dietary restrictions, et cetera. Increase emergency packages to last up to 14 days to reduce the frequency of visits and provide shelf, shelf long-term stable food options with sample food items, with sample food item categories for vegetables, fruits, proteins, grains, dairy, and both per perishable and non-perishable. For any New Yorker in need of food, you can get help today at one of New York City's food pantries, which provide groceries to cook at home or community kitchens, which provide hot meals. A map of local food pantries and other options is available at newyorkcity.gov get food. Or, oops, I wanna repeat that, newyorkcity.gov backslash get food. Or a person seeking this food assistance can also call the emergency food line at 866-888-8777, which is an automated hotline available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As we face this crisis head on, we remain committed to providing access to food for all New Yorkers in need. Thank you for taking the time to hold this hearing at a critical time on this important topic. We look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you very you much. Administration. I just wanna remind you all that throughout the Q&A session, if you could all remain unmuted so that we don't have to have any technical difficulties, if you can all remain unmuted for our question and answer session. And I'll pass it back over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kilwan, and thank you very much, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, Councilmember Grudenchik for questions because he has to leave. Um, but I, uh, I first want to just acknowledge that the work that HRA um, did prior.
prior to the pandemic, uh, uh, setting up Access HRA um, and um, uh, all of the remote systems um, that you have spent years, starting with this administration, um, uh, really not the prior administration, but this administration, um, uh, limited um, um, the difficulties and damage um, and mitigated those damages when um, when the pandemic hit. Um, so uh, you highlighted them, Ms. Fitzpatrick, in your testimony, but um, I, I can only imagine um, how difficult uh, this would have all been um, if we were creating these systems on the fly. And so when you mentioned, um, I think it was with the, um, uh, uh, the PA system, um, being able to, to basically turn that on within a couple of days, um, I, I couldn't imagine having being able to do that, uh, you know, uh, on the on the fly. So I just I just uh, want to acknowledge uh, that this is an example of, of real preparedness on on the part of the administration, um, and um, and it and it it, it 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 worked in large part. So I just want to I want to thank you and acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, and I'll turn it over to Councilmember Grudenchik for questions. And also, we've been joined by Councilmember Bradlander as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. I do regret that I, I have to take at least a, a, a lengthy break today uh, to attend a funeral of um, a dear, dear friend's uh, mother-in-law. Um, uh, unbelievably, he lost his mother and his mother-in-law in the space of an hour uh, this past week. So. Um, today, the funeral for his mother-in-law. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today, um, especially the advocates. Um, we have worked so far, and uh, one of the first hearings that I ever attended with uh, Chair Levin uh, was the annual hearing on hunger uh, soon after I, I came to the council. Um, and I want to echo uh, Chair Levin's comments that um, a lot of what we were able to accomplish over the last six months with this unprecedented uh, pandemic, at least unprecedented in our lifetime, um, was based upon the work that we we're able to do. Um, good morning, Ms. Fitzpatrick. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you, Council Member. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about EFAP, which is certainly um, near and dear to my heart. And um, you had mentioned the funding um, at 20.9 million, and we have worked uh, very closely with the administration and many of the people who are going to testify today to to raise that number. My understanding, though, is that there was an additional 25 or 26 million dollars that um, we allocated uh, in the spring for that. And I don't see that number accounted for this morning um, and obviously very important. It went to uh, some of our largest uh, providers. And I, I would like you to comment on that. First council member, let me give you my sincerest condolences Thank you. for the loss of your friends. Um, it's difficult times and, you know, everyone is suffering at this point and I just hope that there's an end to this pandemic. Well, they just, yeah, she, 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 the two people that passed were not COVID related. They just old age essentially. Okay. But Thank any you. loss is still difficult during it this It is period. tough. Yeah. I'd like to turn um, the, this question over to my um, my colleague, Annette Holmes. She's the Chief Special Services Officer and she manages the EFAP program. Okay. So Annette Holm will respond to your inquiry. Thank you. Good morning. I don't want you to think that we're playing round robin here, but in regards to the 25 million, Kate McKinley from the Food Czar program was, is really the one who can answer that question. And I'll Kate is on the line. Everybody at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Annette, and certainly Chair Levin and members of the committee. Again, I want to extend my, my condolences. That's just tragic. Um, my name is Kate McKenzie, and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. Um, and I, I want to just take a moment um, to acknowledge that um, with Commissioner Garcia's departure, I am and have been since March um, integrally involved and will be continuing the uh, overseeing the management and the operations of the Get Food program and many of the related pieces. 
um, I've had the, the, the real pleasure to be able to work uh, hand in hand with the council um, on the uh, coordination and ultimately distribution of the, of the 25 million that you're referring to councilman. Um, those dollars are actually, um, the contracts are with DSNY. And as you, um, as you may know, uh, we worked certainly very closely with council and council determined the 10 organizations that ultimately served um, as the sort of umbrella organizations that ultimately have ensured that more than 700 pantries across the city received food and funds. Um, and that has just been a, a, a mammoth undertaking and um, I really, again, appreciate the council's um, leadership in ensuring that that program could, could be created. Well, I would like to think that um, since as Chair Levin remarked in his comments, uh, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel here, so to speak, and that New York City um, has infrastructure in place. And we certainly have uh, the infrastructure in our houses of worship and other places where people can go to get food. I, I think that um, the pandemic has really ripped open, if we didn't know it already, but it has really ripped open the fact that too many people in the city uh, are going hungry. Uh, one is too many, obviously, but we know that um, HRA touches uh, some 3 million New Yorkers a year. Um, not all for food, but um, in large measure, many, you know, many people need food. And so it's my hope um, as we start to think about um, budget for next year, um, which will be uh, Mayor de Blasio's last budget, um, that we consider, um, and I hope that all the three people who hear from HRA and any others who may be listening, um, we really need to rethink how um, we feed people in this city. Um, there is absolutely, and I've said this and I'm gonna to continue to say it, um, and I wanna thank Chair Levin for being such a strong supporter on this, as well as the speaker who made this a top priority as soon as he took office. Um, there is no reason for anybody to go hungry in this city. Uh, we have the food, we have the logistics in place. So, um, and I can go on and on, but I'm, I'm running out of time, but um, I do hope that the administration will take to heart that this cannot be a one shot, that we have got to help people in need. Um, I don't live in a, uh, a poor neighborhood. I live in a relatively affluent part of New York City, but I can tell you the work that my office has done and the numbers of people lined up at my local schools to this day uh, are around the block. Um, it's just, just incredible. So um, please take back to Chair Banks if he's not listening, uh, uh, Commissioner Banks, not Chair Banks. Um, that message from me, and I think it's shared by all 50 current members of the New York City Council. With that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I will yield back, and I, I'm sorry I've got to leave, but um, I thank you all for your work, and if, uh, if you would, uh, uh, the Council Committee, um, or whoever's taking testimony, I would appreciate that testimony being forwarded to my Chief of Staff so I could read it uh, when Time's I... Time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Krudenchik, um, and uh, also our condolences on uh, the loss of your, your friend's family. Thank you. Um, uh, we are also joined this morning uh, by Council Members Salamanca, uh, Gibson, and Reynosa. Um, and with that, I will ask a few questions, and then I will be turning it over to colleagues for questions as well. Um, I guess my first question is, uh, can, can you all explain the re uh, kind of how, how the Get Food program and HRA's food programs are working side by side and how are they coordinated? Um, how are they ensuring that um, the, the efforts are not necessarily uh, uh, duplicative but are additive? Which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that just to speak from the, the Get Food perspective. And again, really appreciate the extraordinary partnership with HRA and, and my colleagues specifically within the EFAP program. Um, you know, uh, Councilman, I know you, you also really know this, the Emergency Food Network so well and can appreciate the fragility of it in the best of times, let alone in these tragic times. 
Um, we certainly are working hand in hand, both at exploring the EFAP network, and then also, uh, you know, with regard to this 25 million and just the, the entire landscape of the emergency food network, ensuring that um, in some cases, pantries that are not part of EFAP's program are attended to and able to serve communities um, um, that are in need. And also I wanna make um, a special uh, attention to the task force on racial equity and inclusion that modified some of the, um, the, the EFAP rules to change specifically the time frame of, uh, of a pantry being in existence from six months to four months to be considered for, um, for EFAP uh, participation. Um, so I, I would, it would to say that I'm in touch with EFAP daily um, is, is uh, incredibly uh, realistic, if not multiple times a day to ensure that we're hearing in real time the needs, um, whether it be food needs, funding needs, openings, closures, what have you, um, and can really, um, to, to your colleague, uh, Councilman Grodnick's uh, point, make sure that this network um, comes back even more resilient um, as a result of having gone through this uh, tragedy. Um, thank you. And uh, um, now how, in terms of like, uh, um, uh, caseloads for the get for the get food program um how uh how are those if you kind of give a kind of thirty thousand foot view of how um that program um uh, is working alongside hra's programs and then also is working alongside difta's programs and kind of how um just to give new yorkers a clear picture of of um uh which programs they, they may be uh, qualifying for and which, um, which might serve their needs. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, it's important that New Yorkers do understand the resources available to them. Um, in, the, in the late days of March, um, this, this Get Food Emergency Home Delivery Program was created literally in a matter of days to be able to ensure that all New Yorkers did not have to worry about where their next meal was going to come from. Um, you know, it's been such a long road, but we can think back to March when really the guidance for everyone, in particular seniors, was to stay home. And so thinking about what that would mean for people who could no longer maybe go to the grocery store or um, have a, a chance to be able, the, the money maybe to be able to provide uh, to get deliveries. Remember during those times, even if you could order for deliveries of groceries, the time slots that were available were just so hard to find. So this Get Food program, um, still active and, and very much alive, nyc.gov slash get food or calling 311 if you cannot leave your home to get food, if you have no one who can get food for you or you have difficulty affording private delivery services the city will provide you with, um, with deliveries to your door of emergency meals. Um, so that program at its peak served more than one, served essentially 1.2 million New Yorkers. Um, and at this point, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we're, we're down to about 127,000 New Yorkers who are still utilizing the program. Certainly that's far too many, but on the positive side, it does mean that people um, you know, are, are able to get food by going to the grocery store or utilizing other food access points available. Um, I also wanna make mention certainly of the um, Department of Education's grab and go program. There are more than 400 grab and go locations across the city, predominantly at schools. Once again, my colleague mentioned, but I'll, I'll put the plug in also for the map at nyc.gov slash get food to be able to identify where those locations are. Those will be in operation through Friday of this week, at which point the program will evolve to accommodate for, um, for the return of uh, blended in, in classroom learning. So okay, so so the so the the home delivered meal portion of of the food, and those were those were meals, not necessarily that wasn't um, shelf stable food. It, it shelves. It's predominant, and again, it's it's predominantly shelf stable meals. So each delivery will, would be a box of predominantly shelf stable meals because this is again the 
you know, sort of option of last resort um, to ensure that people had a, a steady supply of food. Those were delivered um, through um, TLC taxis. Um, and we wanted to, again, at the height of this, we were serving more than a million people um, with meals or more than a million meals a day and wanted to make sure that we could scale the program while also providing um, a steady supply of food. So most definitely they were um, tilted on the shelf stable side, but also aligned to very strict nutrition standards um, uh, that the city had. Um, and, and so the decrease um, uh, that you've seen, so almost a 90% decrease since its, since its peak, um, and that's that's because of uh, some of the easing of, so, uh, of restrictions. Um, yeah, you, we monitor the program daily for obviously mm -hmm. to ensure that we have the supply of food and and all of that, and ensuring you know uh, I, I should make note that certainly there are halal, kosher, vegetarian, and standard meal options available. But yes, if we just look at the landscape changes from you know when the program was created back in in March. Um, the number of stores that are new, that are now open, that weren't open, the delivery slots that were open, certainly the utilization and promotion of grab and go, all of these factors um, have made it easier to access food across the city. Now, how many, um, how, how, much, how well was, has grab and go been utilized? Um, extraordinarily well. Um, my colleagues from Department of Education are not here at the moment, but um, I know that we're averaging, you know, um, again, typically between 400 and 500,000 meals a day. Um, and again, uh, the city uh, Department of Education um, offered kosher and halal options as well. Um, so th that program has been has been really significant. Now, what now what happens with that program um, now that school is opening? So are we are we going to? I'm assuming that not all of those grab and go meals were for school age children. Um, sure. Sure. So, so what are we, how are we gonna, how are we, um, how are we doing that? Yep, at a, at a very high level and I'll um, certainly follow up with more information specifically from DOE, but beginning, you know, so again, through the end of this week, so through Friday the 25th, all of those 400 locations will continue to operate as they have, um, you know, for the past several months. Beginning on actually Tuesday, um, uh, the 29th, which is when blended learning um, will commence for elementary schools. Um, many of those schools will transition, those, those public food hubs will decrease to 207 sites and will be open from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, for uh, adults who don't have um, uh, 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 other options. So those sites and that map will be available once again, um, certainly on the DOE's site, um, as well as on nyc.gov slash get food. I'm sorry, just, just interrupt. So you said it's, they're gonna be open from three to 5 p.m. What were they open till now? Sorry. Um, they were, now they, oh. uh, they were open, uh, they were not open that late. I, I'm, I, I can't recall exactly, I'll follow up with it, the hours right now, um, but huh. certainly, can appreciate with the schools really serving um, and all of the uh, serving students and faculty and staff wanting to really separate and, and accommodate mm -hmm. for the school learning versus the, um, the public feeding um, element. Now we had heard that um, uh, a, a number of um, homeless New Yorkers were, were utilizing grab and go. Um, and so there's a, a concern that um, you know, that will, they'll be losing that as an option. Have you guys looked at that and are coordinating with DHS on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a, absolutely a population that we're working um, very closely to ensure um, continuity of services. I really would, would defer that question specifically to my colleagues at DOE, um, but I do know that they're taking in many of um, the, the special populations into consideration. Um, Okay, I'm gonna, let's see, ask about um, with SNAP enrollment. So uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick, if, um, if so looking at um, the testimony, uh, HRA's testimony to the assembly 
on September 9th. Um, uh, that the agency received uh, 50, 56,755 more applications than in April of 2019, which is a 207% increase. Um, do we know what the percentage increases were for the months of, of July and August for the, from the same time of last year? And do we know if, I mean, are we tracking to see kind of whether that the rate of increase has been dropping? Uh, yes, we do have that information here. There was a slight decrease in the number of applications in July of 2020, but after the federal um, pandemic unemployment benefit um, expired, then August applications increased significantly. So in July of 2020, we had 29,762 applications and that was a decrease of 3% compared to July of 2019, um, which at that point was 30,682 applications. In August of 2020, applications increased to 35,723 applications. And that was a 24% increase from the year before. In August of 2019, application volume SNAP application volume was 28,712. Um, and do we know, what's the current number of SNAP recipients in the city? Uh, the current number of SNAP recipients um, as- Recipients um, and households, if, uh, if you have both of that. Okay, yes, I have both those um, figures here. Um, the SNAP households for August, 2020 is 80, 882,201 um, households, which was an increase, which was a, actually was a decrease of about 12% compared to August of 2019. We had 985,088 households at that time in August of 2019. Um, SNAP recipients for August 2020, we had 1,511,568 recipients as of August 2020. And that was a decrease of about 11% from August of 2019, where the number of recipients stood at 1,683,674 individuals. Um. Now, how would that compare those numbers to um, to where what the enrollment was in early March? If I have the because March data here, we have seen an increase in SNAP, obviously since early March. So it must have declined pretty significantly from last August to, to March, I suppose. We'll have to get back to that. I don't have the March data. I have okay. March 2020, but not um, March 2019. Oh no, I, I, March 2020 is fine because I'm, I'm just curious how it's um, how the enrollment has gone from March to today. Well, I just have the number of applications. I don't have oh, the oh, okay. enrollment for oh, um, enrollment. that period. Okay. I may Got be able it. to get it before the end of this hearing. Okay. Um, Do you have the percentage of SNAP applications since the start of the pandemic that have been approved versus how many have been denied? And um, given all of the waivers, what would be the reasons for denial at this point? Yes, I have that information. Um, from March to July of 2020, 46% of our SNAP applications were approved and 52% were denied. The top reasons for denials tend to be um, a, fair, a failure to return to provide verification, excess unearned income, which makes the household ineligible for SNAP, excess earned income, which makes the household ineligible for SNAP. Um, then we have some other um, 
denial reasons like the person is receiving SNAP on another case or they're active on cash assistance. So they're not eligible for SNAP only benefits. And when we compare that data to where we were last year in August of 2019, our top reason for denial back in August of 2019 was a failure to complete or to complete on-demand application interviews. So 45% of our applications were denied in August of 2019 because individuals failed to have an interview. And at that point we had on-demand application interviews. Since we did not have um, application required application interviews during COVID-19 up until August of 2020, that was no longer a top denial reason. And the failure to provide document, failure to provide verification um, rose to 33% of the applications as of August 2020 were denied for failing to provide verification of um, required document, required um, um, mandated eligibility factors. Back in August of 2019, that was a lower rate of denial at 21% because the top denial reason happened to be the failure to have the on-demand application interview. Um, if it's possible, um, and I realize you wouldn't have it now, but for uh, if you could follow up and for month, month by month from April um, till August, if you could provide us the, um, and you've given us a, a lot of this uh, data already, but um, the number of, of um, applications um, uh, and the number of rejections by month, um, as well as the number of closures by month as well uh, for SNAP cases. Um, just as a follow-up uh, from this hearing. Okay. Um, now, we, we've been told um, that there were uh, 8,000 SNAP cases that were closed for failure to recertify as the documented reason for their closure. Um, but that doesn't make sense because they've have, under the federal waiver, they should be automatically um, extended. So the, I thought the recertification um, has been waived. Uh, can you speak to that? Do you know if, uh, what what's happened with those 8,000 cases? Um, there were issues with the extensions. Um, the state of New York provided the six month extension starting in March of 2020. And some households were closed in March because the failure to, to recertify happened prior to receiving the six month extension. So those were legitimate closings. After that six month extension was granted, the state had a file which was supposed to prevent anyone from closing because of failure to recertify. Unfortunately, there were errors on that record and they sent the cases to HRA, HRA and we were able to reopen any cases that were inappropriately closed for failing to recertify after that March file. So there were errors in this transfer of information from the state to New York City but those errors were resolved. So all those 8,000 cases have been, have been um, reinstated? Correct. And there were some cases that were legitimately closed for other reasons, but the cases that were closed for failing to recertify were sent to New York City in order to ensure that the cases were um, appropriately restored. Okay. Um, now, in terms of applications that have been denied because of failure to provide verification. <clears throat> um, we understand that there is um, there's a, a directive, a policy directive from HRA, um, a duty to assist policy directive that states that the JOS worker should not delay or reject an applicant participant's application or re recertification due to missed, missed, missing documentation if the information can be obtained from an other system or through self-attestation, um, if applicable. Um, can you speak to how HRA is ensuring 
that staff is complying with its directive and um, and how is HRA following up with those 20,000 um, applicants uh, to ensure that they that HRA is receiving um, or working to, with the applicant to get that documentation? Most of our documentation requirements have been greatly relaxed during COVID-19. Households can declare their shelter expenses and a number of other factors. It's really at this point about any earned or unearned income that we cannot verify through computer matches. We still have matches that we're running for state unemployment insurance benefits, we still are utilizing the talk system wherever possible to verify earned income. So we're continuing to use collateral contacts as much as possible to get the information that's needed in order to verify um, information in order to make a determination on the case. If all of the information is presented by the household um, prior to September, if all of the information was provided by the household for, as a new applicant, then HRA did not have to have a telephone interview with the household. And any household that did not have all that verification would have had a conversation with HRA with an, with an employee or a redeployed worker in order to gain as much information as possible to see how we could assist that individual with getting that information. Now, with the expiration of the interview waiver, all application cases require an interview. And it's in those conversations that we get an understanding from clients as to how we can best help them to get that documentation um, that they need to verify their eligibility for assistance. For some households, there is an, an ability for us to reach out to employers, but as you can imagine, many employers, when they get, when they get telephone calls, from individuals about a person's employment, they don't want to provide detailed information about the employed individual's income. So we rely greatly on the computer matches in order to verify earned income. Households that are not able to verify their earned income through pay stubs or a letter from, the, from their employer it makes it much more difficult for us to be able to assist them if the employer is, does not cooperate with the city. But we still do reach out to employers where we have that information from the household. We still reach out to them in order to get that information. So the primary issue really is about any type of earned income. Um, we're getting computer matches from the Department of Education to verify residency for children. So we're not requiring households to go to the Department of Education in order to get that information. As I said before, we're using the state unemployment system in order to verify unemployment insurance benefits. Um, we're continuing to use a lot of strategies in order to assist clients during this time, but there are some eligibility requirements that we really do need the client's cooperation in order to assist them. Um. <clears throat> so now with recertification, so I'm, um, I'm a little concerned that now that recertifications are required, um, are you tracking I me mean, day to day or week to week um, to, to see how many recertifications uh, are, are being um, are being completed and making sure that that is on track with what what what, what you need what what you would what your expectation would be in terms of the number of research. So <clears throat> you're knowing that how many cases would would be up for recertification in September. You're making sure that that we're kind of on track for that. Um, um, and then, kind of as a related question, I'm 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 concerned because the on-demand system. Um, uh, was, you know, was very, um, 
uh, useful and would be useful in this case, I'm sure, but um, um, because our understanding is that uh, we're, we're, there's a, there are a lot of dropped calls on the info line and um, and people are not, you know, if, if there's a callback, they're, they're getting a callback from an unidentified number and maybe not picking up the phone. So if you could speak a little bit to the on-demand system and, and what are we doing to ensure that we're not um, dropping, dropping cases because of recertification issues? Well, we currently have a um, partial interview waiver until December of this year. And with that partial interview waiver, we do not have to interview 100% of the SNAP um, act, 100% of the SNAP recertifications. And that's why we are not using on demand for recertifications because that would require 100% of those households to have interviews. Redeployed workers and FIA staff are looking at the case information and making a determination as to whether or not they can recertify the household without having to speak to the individual. And through that process, there's no telephone call that is made to the SNAP recipient asking additional information. Um, as so, so re just to clarify, so, so recertification is done entirely on the HRA side without, without the applicant having to do anything? The recertification, the individual still needs to submit the recertification, but if everything is submitted with that recertification, all the documentation to verify eligibility, we can go ahead and recertify the case without having to have a conversation with the household. So that okay. interview, that partial interview waiver still exists for active cases. Um, and now, and now for, for that documentation, the you know overwhelming majority is 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 done through a smartphone through Access HRA. Yes. At this point, that's correct. Yes, most of our application, uh, most of our recertifications are submitted um, through Access HRA, and the documentation is uploaded and is able to be reviewed by um, HRA staff and redeployed workers. Uh, um, you, what's the percentage on that? I'm sorry. For the use of the on-demand system, it's yeah. In for 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 in terms of recertifications right now, how uh, percentage of cases that have, they're submitting their documentation, because I know that the obviously walk-in, um, you know, the opportunities for walk-ins are, are, are vastly decreased. And so just curious, I just want to make sure that um, there aren't recertification recipients that who are seeking to recertify who um, don't, maybe don't have access to access HRA or are not proficient in using it. Okay. Um, prior to COVID-19, 96% of SNAP applications and 87% of recertification interviews were held over the telephone. But in the months since the pandemic, those numbers have increased to about 89% of SNAP applications submitted online and about 99% of all SNAP business is conducted remotely and outside of our locations. So people have really embraced the mobile app and the document upload and that's made it much easier for people to maintain their benefits during the pandemic. Um, your question regarding, um, regarding recertification for those households that require an interview, HRA is reaching out to them. They'll review information that the household has presented. They'll make a phone call to the household in order to, um, in order to interview them. If they do not reach the individual by telephone with that first time, they'll make a subsequent um, attempt to contact them by telephone. We also send a notice of missed interview to the household to let them know that HRA tried to reach them if after two attempts, we are not able to reach them. And they can always call HRA info line and then um, we will connect with them and have that interview wherever possible after they receive the notice of missed interview. Um, the SNAP, SNAP recertifications for September 
the period opened on August 1st. So we're keeping an eye on it at this point to see how many of those clients actually submit the recertifications compared to this time last year. We don't have that information at this point because we're still in the month of September and applications are still coming in and uh, workers are, are continuing to do the recertifications. What we do know is that with the research numbers that are coming in, that we are pretty on top of those recertification telephone calls. Many of our, many of our workers are making those calls in order if they need to make a call to speak to the household within two or three days after the recertification is submitted. So the process is very efficient right now, given the volume of cases that we are receiving. Um, you mentioned that uh, if we did an on-demand, if we were using on-demand, um, then 100% would have to have a, an interview, is that right? That's correct. There's no way to bifurcate the process to open on-demand for recertification and, and, and call out those that don't need to be interviewed. Because with on-demand, anybody can call. If you're scheduled for an interview, if you're scheduled for research, the system allows you to get into the system and speak to a live operator. And what we try to avoid is individuals calling us when we don't even need to have an interview with them at this point. I see. Um, so in some sense that would make for, ironically, like a less efficient system right now, is that what you're saying? For recertifications, absolutely. Okay. And that was, that was the case before as well, but it wasn't such a, I mean, before the pandemic, that would have been the case too, or is that, a, or is that different? No, it was different because we did not have the partial interview waiver oh. prior to the pandemic. So a hundred percent of those households needed to have a telephone interview. I see. That's okay. why the on-demand system was more efficient. Okay. The partial waiver is until? Until December 30th, 31st. Until December 30th. Okay. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm a little bit confounded why the why these waivers aren't being extended. Uh, is it Congress that extends the waiver, or is it or is it the administration? So, um, for the food stamp waivers, the federal government has to approve all of the state's requests for extensions on these waivers. So, the SNAP recertification waivers were submitted by. New York State OTDA to USDA for approval. And we got approval for some things, but not for others. Starting, we requested a, an approval to extend the waiver of recertifications altogether, but that approval was not granted to us. So that is why we are at this point in the month of September actually having interviews with clients and scheduling recertifications. If individuals do not recertify in the month of September for those cases that are due to expire by September 30th, they will lose their benefits because as of today, we do not have approval from the federal government to extend that waiver. And the waiver was, the extension was submitted by OTDA to the USDA. That is correct. So OTDA has, has asked for every extension that they can ask for? They've, we've, worked with, uh, with our partners in the state to request as many extensions on all of these waivers as possible. So HRA made the request to extend the waivers for the month of September. We really would like to extend all waivers throughout the entire period until the end of the year. But um, our state partners said it has been clear that FNS wants to return to normal. They want cases to be recertified. They want the processes to go back to normal, which is why we do not have a full waiver for application interviews. We had the full waiver for application and recertification interviews in order to just interview those households that did not submit everything that was required. We have since lost that waiver for the application interviews, but we still have a partial interview waiver for the recertifications. So we've been working with our partners and we've submitted um, letters to the state requesting an extension of those federal waivers 
but they have to go to USDA in order to gain approval. You know, is that is that consistent across all states or is New York being treated in any way differently than other states? All states have to go to USDA for extensions and waivers for food stamp related rules. I mean, are the waivers being granted by USDA different for New York than other states or do we not know? Or That's not my understanding at this point. So it's all, so USDA is telling every state that now they have to recertify SNAP clients. That's my understanding is that USDA is encouraging states to go back to normal processing and have full interviews for applicants as well as starting the recertification process. So that at least they're not singling us out, but they are, but the USDA is putting, um, you know, uh, pretty onerous um, requirements on states and localities uh, in terms of recertification in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, with the possible consequence of, of people losing their SNAP benefits um, all across the country. So, yes. um, you know, shows what, um, you know, how little the Trump administration actually cares about people receiving SNAP benefits. And we've heard, um, we've heard from our partners in the state that other states, there are many other states that have gone back to normal processing, but you know, with the volume of cases that we have in New York City, this is mm -hmm. not something that we think we can effectively do. And also, in, while also ensuring that clients don't meet, lose their benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope that our members of the Congress are making it clear um, to the administration that that is that this is very problematic. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleagues, and then I, I will have some, some more questions uh, on the back end of that. Um, I think so. I'll turn it back over to uh, uh, to Ms. Kilowan for Councilmember questions. Chair Levin, I see no raised hands from Councilmember. Oh. Uh, I thought Councilmember Lander had questions. Is he still on the call? Councilmember Lander no longer has questions. Uh, do any members want to ask questions? All right, seeing nobody. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, uh, the option is open. Um, uh, let's see. I wanted to ask about um, about the pandemic unemployment assistance, the six hundred dollars a week. Um, were there were there applications that were denied between August and July for that income, making them <clears throat> making them over income? Yes, we had, we had applications that were denied for excess earned and excess unearned income. There were households um, who first applied for cash assistance or SNAP before the pandemic benefits came through for them. And once they came in, then they were over income for those benefits. So by the time the application was being processed, the individual was actually receiving the $600 per week and as a result was not eligible for assistance. Um, since the pandemic benefit, the $600 has ended, we've encouraged people to reapply for assistance. We cannot go back and retroactively make a determination on those cases at this point. But if they do reapply, then we can examine the application to determine eligibility based on their current income. How are you encouraging them? The um, social media posts and on Access HRA, as well as um, on the HRA intranet. Internet. Okay, so there's a there's a um, like a message that goes out to them on H on those on those specific um, applicants. There's a message that would go out to them. <clears throat> there was a message saying, out telling people that they could reapply for assistance. For individuals who were currently receiving assistance and that and was still eligible for um, SNAP, we removed the the extra six hundred dollars a week once we got the determination that it was that it was expiring. 
So any so th their benefits might go up. Then. Yeah, their benefits. Well, um, because of the emergency uh, allotment that was issued by the state, then their benefits went up to the maximum regardless, even ahead of us rebudgeting those cases, because any household that received less than the maximum received a difference in the allotment based on the, um, the state's emergency allotment supplement. Okay. Okay. So they, right. Okay. So they're still getting the maximum. They are still getting the, they're still getting receiving the maximum. The emergency allotment was, is, is being issued for the month of September as well. Um, but we did go ahead and rebudget cases. So after that allotment, the emergency supplement ends, then the case can get on a recurring basis, receive the correct amount of benefits. Okay. So the state is, the state is not, is not continuing the emergency allotment in past September? We don't know yet. We haven't heard word from the state at this point. Okay, so that's something that that we can do. So so recipients should should ask because that could be that could be a significant amount per month. That could be a couple hundred dollars a month. For yeah. SNAP recipients. Yeah. No, it can be. Um, I have an example here. Um, if you have a household of two individuals, and let's just assume that they were issued two hundred and thirty-seven dollars and regular food stamp benefits because they had other income. Um, the maximum for two people is actually $355. So because of that state supplement, they would get an additional $118. And that's a significant amount of money for households that are struggling during the pandemic. So- 118 apiece? No, for the household. Oh, oh. So the household of two, they would be brought up to $355 nice. per month. And you know we want that. We strongly encourage that to continue for the duration of the pandemic. But we have not received word that we will prioritize wisely, placing the protection and support of human life central to the decision making regarding the allocation of funds coming in the future. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share today. Thank you so much, Carol. I'm now going to call on our next panel and the panelists will be in the following order. Emmanuel Negron, Maria Melchor, Abby Bieberman and Beatrice Diaz Taveras. And we are going to begin with Emmanuel. Your time will start now. Good afternoon, chair and committee members. My name is Emmanuel Negron. Senior Director of Benefit Access at Med Council, responsible for leading our citywide SNAP outreach and application assistance to neediest communities. In response to the economic impact of the pandemic, HRA and DSS has executed business processes allowed by state waivers to keep up with the citywide demand for SNAP assistance. This has included everything from extended recertification periods, waiving client telephone interviews, using emergency allotments to bring households to the maximum allotments, waiving ABOT work requirements, and allowing clients verbal consent over telephone to file applications with HRA. In addition, the commissioner's, uh, Commissioner Banks' weekly conference call has provided important updates and community partners of HRA's response to the pandemic. More is needed to address the ever-increasing demand for food assistance as New York New Yorkers recover from the economic hardship caused by the pandemic. Clients who contact the HRA benefit, HRA info line continue to experience long wait times and calls have dropped due to thousands of New Yorkers seeking help and flooding the phone bank system. While HRA SNAP offices have been consolidated to just one in every borough to focus on processing the thousands of new applications, the Access HRA online Client Portal has been the client's main entry point to access SNAP and emergency food assistance. Thousands who are not capable or lack access to technology are not able to navigate the Access HRA online SNAP application portal to seek assistance. Pushing the most vulnerable New Yorkers to rely on non for profit organizations like Met Council for SNAP assistance and emergency food assistance, which we see firsthand due to the increase and requests received by our benefit helpline staffed by 14 bilingual SNAP specialists and the increase in supply of food to our network of over 
of 140 emergency food distribution sites. As of March, MedCouncil's Benefit Assistance Helpline has seen a 53% increase in clients seeking SNAP assistance from across the five boroughs. For this reason, it, it has expanded its SNAP operations to hire additional six SNAP specialists that speak Russian, Urdu, Mandarin, Cantonese, Haitian Creole, and Arabic. Um, our emergency food program has seen triple the number of clients and the increase of the increase the amount of food distribution by 310%. And yes, the need continues to grow while our resources don't allow us to keep pace. The recovery will require a collaborative impact model where community-based organizations like Met Council and HRA and DSS partner together to connect all needy New Yorkers to food assistance. Report for non for profits Your time is up. To the, to the recovery from the pandemic. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Emmanuel. I will now call on Maria Milcher. Your time will begin now. Thank you to Chair Levin and the General Welfare Committee for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you to everyone who has come before me. I echo your testimonies about the gravity of this crisis. My name is Maria Melkor, and I will be delivering the Legal Aid Society's testimony today. I represent clients who are seeking access to SNAP and other benefits such as cash assistance, which also play a critical role in uh, keeping families fed. Uh, I help New Yorkers apply for benefits for the first time or update their cases so that they are receiving uh, the full benefits that they are entitled to. We are making five recommendations, but I will be uh, making three of those uh, now. So number one, uh, we recommend that HRA give its staff phones that clients can call back and not reject any applications or close any cases for failing to recertify until this option is in place. Currently, all cash assistance clients and, and most SNAP clients must have a telephone interview to have their applications approved. If the client misses HRA's phone call for this interview, even by a second, or because it went straight to voicemail, they cannot immediately call back that number. The client must call InfoLine or another indirect phone number and wait for HRA's call. After two failed attempts to reach the client by phone for their mandatory interview, HRA denies the application. Since HRA shifted to phone interviews, the number of cash assistance applications rejected for failure to keep or complete an interview has increased 10 times. From April to June of 2020, 13,000 applications were rejected compared to 1,300 from January to March. This is a huge problem and it's only going to get worse as recertifications restart. About 50,000 clients will need to be recertified for SNAP and cash assistance with phone interviews per month just to keep their benefits. Number two, we recommend that HRA provide realistic alternatives to applying for benefits online. Due to COVID, HRA closed most of its SNAP and job centers Currently, clients are encouraged to apply using Access HRA or by phone. Many New Yorkers cannot access online services due to an array of reasons. HRA will continue to miss thousands of clients if they make access to benefits reliant on access to online platforms. HRA must improve access to phone applications by fixing the phone system and spreading information about the availability of these phone applications. The time is up to clients and HRA staff. I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, HRA must also improve its paper application process and continue creating community partnerships with nonprofits to help New Yorkers apply for cash assistance in addition to SNAP. Uh, finally, we recommend that HRA replace InfoLine with a more accessible phone line system as soon as possible since InfoLine is so complex unwieldy and just lacks adequate capacity right now. 
Uh, we urge the council to fix HRA's phone problems uh, so that clients who can't get online or want to avoid visiting the center can get their SNAP and other benefits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, and I apologize for getting your name, your last name incorrect. I'll now call on Abby Bieberman. Chair Levin, council. We'll begin now. Chair Levin, council members and staff, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on SNAP administration. My name is Abby Bieberman. I'm a senior supervising attorney of the Public Assistance and SNAP practice and the Public Benefits Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, our SNAP, our practice is a team of de dedicated attorneys and paralegals who represent clients having trouble accessing or maintaining public assistance and SNAP benefits in addition to shelter advocacy. Uh, we represent clients at administrative fair hearings, conduct advocacy with Department of Social Services, job and SNAP centers, and bring impact litigation to ensure that our clients are obtaining and maintaining an adequate level of benefits and shelter services. So in March, um, ad advocates were working closely with HRA pursuant to local law 169, um, right when the pandemic hit. And we quickly pivoted as a group to figure out how HRA was gonna continue to provide benefits to our clients and address the inevitable influx, um, all while providing their services almost entirely remotely. Um, so while many of the changes during COVID have been tremendously helpful for our clients, there are some areas that still need improvement. Um, we do think HRA's continued uh, and expanded use of access HRA has been beneficial for many of our clients as well as NILAC advocates who use the provider portal. We would also like to see uh, further expansion of access HRA for rental assistance programs. But regarding SNAP, um, there are a few recommendations we have. First, um, I'm gonna echo what others have said, HRA must increase info lines capacity um, clients have benefited from the signature and interview waivers and the emergency allotments that um, we've spoke, that people have spoken about during this hearing. Um, but uh, without increased capacity of info line, some of these are not some of these um, waivers really have no impact. So for example, the signature waiver has made it possible for our clients without internet access to complete the SNAP application over the phone. Um, and these are clients, many of whom may have gone into the center or had a friend assist them with a paper application. Um, and then they may have submitted that signed application at a center. But with the job centers closed, these clients have no way of accessing benefits. Um, so assuming a person could leave their home safely, there was no place for them to obtain an application. Um, many people aren't able to fill them out on their own, uh, mail them in. And so the um, interview waiver, the, the, sorry, the signature waiver, allowed clients to complete this over the phone. Um, but the disadvantage of this option is that it's causing more traffic on InfoLine, a number that so many clients are relying on um, for questions related to their benefits, especially now that they can't um, visit SNAP centers. Uh, so in addition to that, attention must be allocated to processing upcoming recertifications. A lot of people have spoken about this and I'm gonna wrap up quickly but there's gonna be a huge influx. And even though HRA is saying that they're gonna be able to handle um, with interview waivers, this influx, we're very concerned about the processing of recertification. Your time is up. Clients. May I have one, uh, 30 seconds to say just one yes, final course, recommendation? Yeah. Um, we do think that HRA must reopen job and SNAP centers as soon as possible. Um, the reliance on InfoLine and Access HRA is causing too many clients to fall through the cracks. And these are our most vulnerable clients, including seniors and the homeless, who are not able to utilize these platforms. And I just wanted to note one thing um, that Lisa Fitzpatrick said, which was that um, they would like, it, it sounded like there was maybe gonna be a move toward keeping some of the centers closed even after the pandemic and increasing reliance on some of these other methods. Um, I have a lot of concerns about that, but one thing I just wanted to remind everyone is that prior to the pandemic, centers were overcrowded. So if HRA is able to achieve some of what they need to without foot traffic at the centers, that's great, but that should just reduce the number of people going into the already overcrowded centers. Those centers should all reopen as soon as possible and then maybe there will be normal level numbers of clients in those centers at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. I'll now call on Beatrice Diaz Taveras. Your time will begin now. P 
Beatrice, we're having some technical difficulties hearing Beatrice, so I am going to circle back and call on Beatrice later if we're able to have her on this call. So at this point, I'm going to call up our next panelists in the following order, Natasha McCray and Abraham Gross. And I wanna remind panelists to please wait for the cue from the Sergeant at Arms before you begin speaking so that we can start the timer. And I'd just like to um, let this past panel know all of these recommendations are you know, incredibly important um, and the value of having uh, your perspective on the ground um, on what's actually happening with clients is totally invaluable to us here at the council. So we will be um, uh, taking all these suggestions um, and uh, ensuring that um, that the administration is is uh, hearing them and, um, and and putting them into you know that they're, they're re responding to it that they're that they're putting it into practice. So. Um, I just want to thank all of you for, for these very um, practical and um, constructive suggestions. Thank you, Chair Levin. I'm now going to call on Natasha McCray. Mm, thank you. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natasha McCray, and I live in the Bronx with my two children. I'm a member of Hunger Free America's Food Action Board, which helps advocate for the needs of low-income families in New York City. I just came to the hearing to discuss how the city has been doing in helping us as individuals get food. Um, I'm a single mother and when COVID first started, it took months before unemployment hit. I was getting $509 a month in SNAP benefits which was not nearly enough to cover the cost of food costs while my children were at home from school. Um, with school being closed for three and a half months, we used the school grab and go sites that help supplement meals, but literally it was the same meals day in and out, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, turkey or beef and bologna, milk. Uh, even worse, at the beginning of the pandemic, we would go to the schools and they would tell us that there were no more food available. And this was multiple times in the weeks. The pandemic EBT program was a great help to get my children extra food, but there were also issues with that. I received benefits for my teenage son, uh, but not for my daughter who was in a preschool and a pre-K for all program. The expansion of the, pre, the PEBT and the SNAPs are important because low-income families need healthy food options and help buying things at the supermarket, eggs, milk, cheese and meat products have been severely overpriced. And I tried using the online snap shopping and that too was a nightmare. I was happy to see that the house passed the Heroes Act back in May, but have been disappointed and frustrated that the Senate hasn't passed it too. Through my work with Hunger Free America, I know that there had been a permanent increase to my snap and an expansion of the PEBT program, which would really help get food for my children. Another problem is why is there are so many different offices to go to and so much trouble to get these programs. I feel like there's always um, problems with giving details about your family, your finances, and it feels like people are being criminalized and penalized for needing assistance from the government. There are pharma income and resources, but it feels like the government makes it hard as possible to get those services and it's shaming for people like myself. A better job needs to be done giving assistance expeditiously without shame and guilt. If we're all American, then we should all be treated equally, including when services are needed. The widening separation of the poor and the rich just continues to show how much further we have to go until that becomes a reality. There should be a one-step process for all of these programs and all these different agencies, WIC, SNAP, Medicaid, free school program, rental or utilities should all be combined together into one application and save people the wasteful paperwork or having to go into offices and uh, save people their dignity. Also working to integrate the IT and software systems to better serve the 21st century. These are some of the reasons that I just hope that the bills introduced by Senator Gillibag gets passed and that we aren't asking for too much. We just hope that Congress just takes their action and the city can do everything to make that reality. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. 
I'm now going to call on our next panelist, Abraham Gross. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, Chair Levine, and thanks for this opportunity. My name is Abraham Gross, and I am respectfully asking you, Chair Levine, again, to recognize the troubling gap between the information given by the administration and the reality. Just as one illustration, I am respectfully asking the Honorable Chair to walk over to the closest food dispensaries in your district and see for yourself whether or not the food given is nutritional, nutritionally sufficient to, to sustain the well being of an adult. The discrepancy um, between the idea that this food is sufficient and the reality, which is that it's not, is compounded by the high cost that taxpayers are paying. It's hard to understand how the food that is given amounts to the $11 um, that it is allegedly costing taxpayers. It would be much more beneficial, as said by a previous panelist, to take those $11 as in the form of a voucher uh, to a fast food eatery where the person could receive a more nutritious hot meal. On a more personal note, I can't breathe were the last words pleaded by George Floyd before his life was callously deprived by public servant acting in official capacity. Those words were heard by other public officials in close proximity with the authority to intervene, but who took no meaningful measures to challenge the abuse of authority that was threatening to deprive a human being of his life. Instead, they stood by they watched, they heard, but they did nothing. Since December 23rd, 2019, when I was forced by our city agencies into homelessness for the first time, despite hundreds of apartments for which I was eligible, through the challenge of surviving hunger, through the challenge of being denied SNAP without any explanation, and through the COVID-19 pandemic and my mother's hospitalization, I've been begging the words, I can't breathe, with every public official there is, including every member of city council. I've been pleading these words, I can't breathe, to no avail. The response ranges from indifference to will promise to get back to you and follow up, but they never do. And the question I have, Chair Levin, please, like, am I doing something wrong? What else is an aggrieved citizen who's being tortured and abused, who's the suffering? time is up. I just finished this sentence, whose mother is suffering just because of pure improper misconduct, greed and corruption, what am I doing wrong, Chair Levin? Please. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Gross. I, I, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I think that um, you know our our system needs to be better at re responding to the needs of clients, and so um, I know that this is not sufficient, but we will we will follow up with you and make sure that. Um, you know, we're looking through all of um, your interactions with, with city officials and making sure that everything has been um, and continues that needs to be done appropriately. So I, I appreciate you, you being here to testify and, um, and we will we will continue to, to look into it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gross. At this point, if we had inadvertently missed anyone, would like to testify today. We're asking that you please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order your hand has been raised. Seeing no hands raised, Chair Levin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I want to thank, um, I thank everybody that, that testified today, members of the public, members of the administration, 
um, we continue to have our work cut out for us and um, we need to continue to put pressure on the state and the federal um, members of Congress and, and, and the administ federal administration um, uh, to continue to make sure that, uh, that people are getting the food that they need, um, that all the appropriate waivers are extended. Um, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we're not out of the woods yet. And, um, and so uh, I wanna make sure that, uh, that we're doing everything we can. If anyone has any um, issues they wanna make sure to bring to our attention, um, feel free to uh, send us a follow-up email. You can send it to my email address at s Levin at council.nyc.gov. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank Aminta Kilowan, our senior counsel committee, uh, for conducting the hearing today. I want to thank our sergeants at arms um, uh, for putting this all together and ensuring um, the effectiveness of the hearing. And, uh, and with that, uh, this year.